As we saw in the last episode, the Mongol men under Subadai had marched across Eastern and Central Europe, defeating everything in their path. In two battles, days apart, they destroyed the Polish armies at Leibniz and the Hungarian armies at Maui Heath. The path was open into the Holy Roman Empire and France, who would have offered even less resistance than the Poles or Hungarians. And then, from the European perspective, they were spared, with the Mongols withdrawing just when their way forward was open. This saving grace was provided by the realities of Mongol politics, in a fashion that would become familiar over the years to the Mongol story and others. The fierce, charismatic, and past his prime alcoholic king had died on a hunting trip. I said Ogede Kagan had died on a hunting trip. The story is murky. Given his love for alcohol, he probably died in a drunken stupor. But rumours circulated that his drink may have been poisoned by his own wife in order to pave the way for a difficult, arrogant, and cruel son. Now, I said rumours surrounded Ogede's wife Torigini, paving the way for her son Guyuk. Regardless of how it happened, the death of Ogede brought to the surface tensions that had previously been hidden. No, tensions that had previously been hidden in the Mongol Empire. European history often paints the Mongols as barbarians, with simple pleasures who are only interested in conquering their enemies and taking from them. We've tried to contrast that view with the positives of Mongol rule, their organisation and laws, religious tolerance and trade. But when you view the famous Mongol leaders in comparison to their wives and daughters, it's easy to see why they're painted as such brutes. Women had a much larger role in Mongol society and power structures than European women, and this produced some exceptionally smart, capable, powerful and subtle women who in many ways were much more influential than the Mongol men. These men, who, to be fair, could fight pretty well, often didn't have the subtle skills required to rule effectively. Genghis Khan seemed to know this fact too, holding the Council of Borte above many of his male advisors and seeking strong, capable women as wives for his sons. After the death of Ogade in 1241, power officially rested in the hands of Ogade's widow as Queen Regent, Torogini Khatun. A cruel tie was meant to be held electing a new Kagan, but for a cruel tie to be seen as legitimate, it required that all the heads of all the great families be present. Batu, the leader of the House of Jochi, was suspicious of Torogini and refused to attend, running his own provinces independently. No, he... I said Batu was suspicious of Torogini. That's right. The lack of a cruel tie, however, meant that Torogini Katun continued to rule the largest empire in history for nearly five years. Torogini Katun is a... Torogini Katun is an interesting character in history. She was clearly smart and capable. From the years 1241 to 1246, she ruled the Mongol Empire, consolidating power by appointing advisors and administrators who were loyal to her, and set the stage for her son Guyuk, Guyuk to be elected as Kagan. She kept the empire running and expanded it in both China and the Middle East. The Middle East! She kept the peace among rival Khans, forged alliances with powerful generals. In China, for the love of God! <sighs> and she rebuilt areas destroyed in war, but she also made enemies. While Torogini was attempting to hold a cruel tie to elect her son Guyuk, other strong women were also playing the Game of Thrones. There, I said it. Are you happy now? Do you think you could actually show the right pictures for once? Good. One of these strong women was Guyuk's young wife, Kamish. Already? Che Kaimish gained a dominant position over her mother-in-law Torogini when the Kurultai was finally held in 1246 and her husband Guyuk was elected Kagan. Guyuk, in typical Mongol manly fashion, was great at the side of life that included fighting or issuing threats. When the Pope sent ambassadors to Guyuk to ask for peace and to ask that the Mongols submit to the Christian God, Guyuk replied with, God? Without God-inspired courage we have wrought massive destruction on every land from the east to the west. You now, Pope. If you want to have peace and friendship with us, subject your will to us and bring us tribute. For if you do not obey our instructions and do not journey to us, we are certain that you will have war. After that, we do not know what the future holds. Only your god knows that. But Guyuk, like his father, was an alcoholic, and much of the detail of running the empire fell to Kaimish. Torogini's loyal advisors were all replaced with those loyal to Kaimish, and Torogini was sidelined as a power in the Mongol Empire. But it wasn't all smooth sailing for Kaimish. As she ruled, another strong Mongol woman would be quietly building alliances and training her sons to be ready for an opportunity. Her name was Sorgatani, and in many ways, the leader of one of the most powerful houses of the Mongol Empire. One Persian observer remarked, If I were to see among the race of women another who was so remarkable a woman as this, I would say that the race of women is superior to the race of men. Sorgatani, the daughter- No! No, look, I can't! No, it's... no, it's, it's unprofessional. Yes, I realise he's not getting paid, nor am I. 
Not until people started sponsoring us on the Patreon page, but... No. Okay, fine. Sorgatani, the daughter-in-law of Genghis Khan, brought her sons up to be more like her and Genghis than many of the other males in the royal family. Monka, Kublai, Pulagu, and Arik were all Mongol men, no doubt, but they also possessed some of the wit and strategic thinking that made Genghis great, and they learned this from their mother. Sorgatani realized that for her sons to take power and rule effectively, they would need to be educated, and they would need to ally themselves with dominant religions. And then, when the opportunity came, this would give them powerful claims to Mongol leadership. While Sorgatani and her sons bided their time, the empire was being ruled by the difficult Guyuk and his more talented wife, Kaimish. As mentioned before, Guyuk Kagan was arrogant, often drunk, and cruel. He had long hated Batu from the House of Jochi, who had refused to attend the Kurultai of 1246 and was running the northwestern provinces as a separate entity. Guyuk gathered troops and advanced towards the northwestern provinces to punish Batu. Sorgatani, however, seeing an opportunity to gain power for her sons, warned Batu that Guyuk was on his way, and together they formed an alliance. In 1248, before Guyuk Kagan could make it to the northwestern provinces, he died, under mysterious circumstances. Kaimish became queen regent and, like her mother-in-law Torogini, would rule the empire until the next Kurultai in 1251. Things did not look good for Kaimish though, as Sorgatani outmaneuvered her. When the Kurultai was held in 1251, with the support of Batu, one of Sorgatani's sons, Monka, was elected the new Kagan. Kaimish, knowing that if Sorgatani and her sons consolidated power, she would be sidelined or worse, launched a daring and violent plan to rid herself of her rivals. While Monka Kagan was celebrating this election, Kaimish and her sons sent a disguised army to murder their enemies at the celebration feast. No, a celebration feast, not a wedding, and besides, it turns out differently, so just, let's, let's not start again, yeah? Sorgatani and Monka Kagan got lucky and accidentally discovered the plot. Horrific purges followed where hundreds of conspirators were executed and exiled. Kaimish was captured, stripped naked, and interrogated by Sorgatani. Eventually, as the Mongols didn't like spilling Ronga royal blood, to punish Kaimish for the plot... When you play the Game of Thrones, you win. Or you get sewn into a bag and thrown into a river. Sorgatani had only a few short months to celebrate her victory, however. She died in 1252. But her sons would go on to control much of the Mongol Empire and expand it to its greatest extent. We'll learn more about Monka Kagan and the rest of Sorgatani's sons in the next episode, but I want to leave you now with one of the most famous of Mongol women. Her name was Aya, I mean Kutulun. Now you got me doing it. The daughter of a powerful Khan. No, that doesn't mean you can... Yeah, better. She was an athlete who could ride and fight as well as any of her brothers. She didn't just take part in battles with the men. She was said to have been a great warrior in her own right. She could snatch a prisoner like a hawk snatches a chicken. When the time came to marry, she refused to stick to tradition insisting that anyone that wished to marry her would have to beat her in a wrestling match. If they lost the wrestling match, they would have to pay 100 horses. Kutulun is said to have remained unmarried, but she managed to earn 10,000 horses. It is unfortunate to note that within a few generations of Borte, Torogini, Kaimish, Sorgatani and Kutulun, women became less prominent in Mongol history. The Mongols began to take on the characteristics of the people they conquered, and these people valued women less than people like Genghis Khan. Perhaps the most interesting thing though is the fact that as the influence of the Mongol women declined, so too did the influence of the Mongol Empire. Why did the Mongols withdraw from Europe in 1241? Why couldn't a Kurultai be held for five years? Who ruled until the Kurultai of 1246? Who was named Kagan in 1246? Who ruled the empire from 1248 to 1251? Who led the plot to kill Monka Kagan and how did they die?